The Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western was formed on March 11, 1853. Truesdale became president on March 2, 1899. In a video that I published not too long ago, we began our trackside adventure here in Yatesville, Pennsylvania. Today, we're back at Yatesville for another northbound chase, but unlike the first time, today I knew exactly what I came to Yatesville for. If you recall the last video, a 10 minute delay getting out of Yatesville resulted in me getting to this spot with only a few seconds to spare. Today, no delays. I'm completely set up when today's 10Z comes screaming around the bend.
So here we go again, northbound and out of town. Up Interstate 81 we go. By now it's probably obvious to you what my interest in today's train is. The red RJ Corman units are headed to Binghamton, New York, where the 9009 will head west to Owego, New York, and the Owego Harford Railroad, I presume. While the 1208 will come back south to Taylor, where it will be taken to the Luzerne and Susquehanna that neighbors the Reading and Northern's Pittston Yard, perhaps replacing the 1265 shown here in a previous winter. The 1265 is an EMD SW1200. This one is of Missouri Pacific heritage. Both the LNS and the Owego Harford, along with the Lehigh Railway, are part of the Owego Harford Railroad Group and were sold to the R.J. Corman Railroad Group around 2019. The 1208 is an EMD SW1200 that once worked at the clearing yard of the Belt Railroad of Chicago. The 9009 is an XBNO GP9 and today has been wired for remote control operation. It's also the highest numbered four digit diesel on the RJ Corman locomotive roster. Proceeding north on I 81, we can see the 10Z stretching its way up the grade and through the namesake town of Clark Summit. Once cresting the summit, the Z will have a mostly downward slide past the town of Nicholson, where it will cross over one of the most impressive man made structures on planet Earth. The Tunkhannock Creek Viaduct has been called the ninth wonder of the world. It's a concrete deck arch bridge on the Nicholson Cutoff Railroad segment of the Norfolk Southern Railway Sunbury Line that spans Tunkhannock Creek in Nicholson, Pennsylvania. The massive reinforced concrete bridge celebrated its centennial in November 2015. The world's largest concrete railroad bridge for more than 50 years and one of the coolest bridges anywhere on the planet, the Tunkhannock Viaduct was built by the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad from 1912 to 1915 under the vision and direction of Railroad President Truesdale and was part of a major improvement to the railroad. It was dedicated and ready to go on November 6, 1915. The DL&W built the viaduct as part of its 39.6-mile Nicholson Cutoff, which replaced a winding and hilly section of the route between Scranton, Pennsylvania and Binghamton, New York, saving 3.6 miles or 21 minutes of passenger train time and one hour of freight train time. The bridge was designed by the DL&W's Abraham Burton Cohen and other key DL&W staff like Chief Engineer G.J. Ray, Engineer of Construction F.L. Wheaton, and Resident Engineer in charge of the construction C.W. Simpson. The contractor was Flickwer and Bush, including General Manager F.M. Talbot and Superintendent W.C. Rittner. I wonder what's with all the initials. At the turn of the 20th century, the Lackawanna Valley, which included Scranton and along with neighboring Wilkesbury, was the industrial hub of northeastern Pennsylvania. Settled in the early 1800s, the area rapidly grew to be a hub of commerce and manufacturing because of the enormous anthracite coal reserves just below the surface. Pennsylvania's anthracite region eventually came to produce a whopping 80% of the world's anthracite coal, a clean, hot-burning fuel that was perfect for running machines and building empires. Now let me read that for you again. Pennsylvania's anthracite region eventually came to produce a whopping 80% of the world's anthracite. Not America's anthracite, the world's anthracite. A clean, hot-burning fuel that was perfect for running machines and building empires. Anthracite coal is formed by higher temperature and pressure and has a higher carbon content and burns cleaner and hotter than bituminous or soft coal. The state of Pennsylvania has three large anthracite coal fields. The northernmost field, which runs through Luzerne and Lackawanna counties. The middle field, which encompasses Carbon, Northumberland, Susquehanna, Schuylkill, and the southern Luzerne counties. And the southern field, which runs through Dauphin, Schuylkill, and Carbon counties. Although coal mining operations in northeastern Pennsylvania aren't anywhere near what they were in the 19th and early to mid 20th centuries, there's still a stable market for the legendary anthracite, that hard coal that northeastern Pennsylvania has the country's biggest supply of, the coal that fueled the Industrial Revolution and beyond, the coal that's used to this day for heating and still some industrial purposes such as steel manufacturing and sugar beet refining. Since it's rich in carbon, the highest grade anthracite is used for water filtration including municipal treatment plants. The high carbon content and the fact that it yields a high BTU when it burns make anthracite useful in metal smelting and fabrication. And while it's true that the black diamonds don't have as many outlets as they did a century ago, still, they haven't lost their luster or their lucrativeness. And contrary to what you might think, 
Coal is still alive and kicking in northeastern Pennsylvania. Today, about 95% of the anthracite mined is from the Hazleton area south. However, north of Hazleton, Casey Casa Coal in the little town of Laughlin stands as one of the last coal breakers in northeastern Pennsylvania. Many historians consider Scranton as the industrial center of the region. The huge coal industry, iron and steel production, railroading and railroad building, food processing, large-scale fabrication, and the textiles industry all played a significant role in the area's growth. The region became the powerful engine that drove America's industrial revolution. Let me read that for you again. The region became the powerful engine that drove America's industrial revolution. Around the turn of the 20th century, the DL&W began to look at ways to straighten and flatten its route to Buffalo, New York, in an attempt to be more competitive with nearby railroads. To do so, the Lackawanna used two cutoffs, one that straddled the Pennsylvania and New Jersey borders known as the New Jersey Cutoff, and later another in upstate Pennsylvania known as the Nicholson-Halstead Cutoff. The Nicholson Bridge provided the capacity for increased goods, including coal, iron, and steel, and passenger traffic in the Northeast that contributed to the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and former President Theodore Roosevelt were among the many people that came to view this one-of-a-kind bridge. The Kingsley Bridge and Staruka Viaduct, also within the region and nearby Susquehanna County, are also a great must-see for those who love to see spectacular old bridges. Since being built, the ownership has passed through the DL&W to the Erie Lackawanna in 1960, Conrail in 1976, the Delaware and Hudson in the early 80s, Guilford Transportation in the early 80s, the New York Susquehanna and Western, Canadian Pacific in 1991, and finally the Norfolk Southern in 2015, which had trackage rights over the Sunbury subdivision from 1999 to 2015 when they bought the line outright. Now the Sunbury Line, it goes from Binghamton, New York, down to DuPont Junction in DuPont, Pennsylvania, and continues on to Sunbury, Pennsylvania, as the river line where it meets the old Pennsylvania Railroad Buffalo Line into Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. In 1975, the American Society of Civil Engineers named the viaduct a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark, and in 1977, it made its way onto the National Register of Historic Places. Accessible from routes 11 and 92, the bridge is part of the Viaduct Valley Way Scenic Byway. Say that fast three times. The bridge is 2,375 feet long and 34 feet wide. It's 240 feet above stream level and 300 feet above bedrock. There are 12 arches with 10 being 180 feet across and 2 being 100 foot arches. This makes the bridge longer and nearly as high as the famous Kinzua Bridge in northwest Pennsylvania and it's also much larger than the nearby Staruka Viaduct that I mentioned earlier. The Tunkhannock Creek Viaduct is also known as the Nicholson Bridge, Nicholson Viaduct, or sometimes simply as the Tunkhannock Viaduct. For over a century, many have celebrated the Tunkhannock Viaduct as one of the world's most impressive man-made wonders. Even today, it continues to inspire awe in both casual onlookers, dedicated photographers, engineers, and architectural enthusiasts. The community honors its history every September during the annual Nicholson Bridge Day Festival. From approximately where we last saw the 10Z in Clark Summit all the way to the yard at Conklin is known as the Pennsylvania Cutoff. The Pennsylvania Cutoff was engineered by the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western during the Truesdale era of the early 1900s in the same vein as the New Jersey Cutoff and the Paul and Skill Viaduct. One challenge to chasing trains on the Pennsylvania Cutoff is that it was originally built with no grade crossings. Here at New Milford, also called Somerville, is the only grade crossing on this 39.6 mile stretch having been installed sometime after the original construction of the line. It's not long before the flashers and warning bells of the school road grade crossing are activated by the approaching of the 10Z that's barreling down the main line.
One other reason that I chased 10Z up the line was because I knew that they'd be meeting the southbound 11Z here at New Milford. Unfortunately, for some odd reason, the 11Z decided to lay back behind the bend, out of view when the meet took place. But not long after the 10Z disappeared north and out of the picture, the 11Z creeped around the bend with a GE wide cab rebuild on the point. And while this train takes its sweet nature time, I can share with you some interesting facts about the Pennsylvania cutoff this train will negotiate. The Clark Summit Halstead cutoff is 39.6 miles long. In 1950, the Phoebe Snow ran the 58.6 miles to Binghamton, New York from Scranton in 70 minutes non-stop with an average speed of 49 miles per hour. The Pennsylvania cutoff was divided into 10 sections. The New Jersey cutoff was divided into 7 sections. Both cutoffs were built with no grade crossings. All of the 11 stations of the Pennsylvania cutoff were standing as of 1967. Of those, 8 were built brand new and 3 were standing before the cutoff was built. The speed limit on the Pennsylvania cutoff has varied over the years but has been as much as 80 miles per hour for passenger trains and 60 miles per hour for freight. The Nicholson Viaduct is 2,375 feet long and 240 feet high with an additional 60 feet down to the bedrock. Going northbound, the Pennsylvania cutoff ends at around Halstead, Pennsylvania, just over the river from Great Bend. Like Halstead and Clark Summit, New Milford Station was kept after the building of the cutoff because it was close to the new main line. New Milford Township, Pennsylvania, which had a population of 2,042 as of the 2010 census, is sometimes called Summersville, as we mentioned before. The Delaware and Hudson took over operating the Pennsylvania Cutoff on October 8, 1980, and the rest we know is history.
I waited for the 11Z to make its way into town, and just like coming out of the siding at New Milford, it took its sweet time coming into the Taylor Yard. From here, the Z will go to Rockville, where it will swap blocks of cars before proceeding on to Hagerstown, Maryland, and Roanoke, Virginia. Oh! <laughs>